Alrighty, everyone. Welcome back to the Rare Petro Podcast. This is another episode of Hydrocarbon History, and I strongly urge you to watch this podcast on YouTube if you aren't already. I have a ton of fun editing these videos, and I think you'll have a ton of fun watching them. So go ahead, just search Rare Petro on YouTube, and you'll probably find what you're looking for. But that's all the housekeeping I've got for today, so let's kick things off. Those of you who've been listening to the podcast might know this by now, but I am an Iowan with family in the farming business. I got the idea for this episode when looking at commodity prices. You see, I've uh, got this app that tracks oil prices, and I like it a lot. Very simple design. Gets me the data I need quickly. I'll be sure to link it below. This app also covers commodities. When you hear the word commodities, I'm sure if you think of your standard things like oil and valuable metals, things that get traded on the regular. But there also exists a market for, say, grain futures, like corn. <laughs> Not only that, but orange juice, cattle, hogs, sugar. I mean, many other things you might be surprised to find in an app called Oil Price Live. When you think about it, these things hold value in the same way hydrocarbons do. They're units of energy. The way a car runs off of gasoline, you run off of fat, protein, and carbohydrates, sugars too, that you find in different sources of carbon energy, plants and animals usually. The thing is, we didn't always have a global market of futures guiding the value of these perishable commodities and the grocery stores that distribute them, so how did we get here? Well, that is the topic of today's episode. We will be looking at food security. You see, way back when humans led simple lives thousands of years ago, people lived in rather nomadic societies. By that I mean they were mobile, moving, walking all across wherever they could. Similar to the way birds fly to warm weather, humans would move to regions that were rich with resources whenever they could. Anthropologists often describe these societies as hunter-gatherer societies because that was the job of most in the community. If you were able-bodied, you would either gather forageable materials like nutritious bark, leaves, and berries, or you would be a hunter of animals. Humans are exceptionally great at traveling long distances and were actually able to tire out their prey before bringing them back to their community. This form of sustenance was sufficient for most communities and is even still practiced by an estimated 10 million people worldwide today. So what changed from then to now? It all started out with one of, well, I'll say, two of mankind's greatest traits, a combination of ingenuity and laziness. Someone, through accident or careful observation, figured out that some foods could be put in soil and they would reproduce. Some anthropologists estimate that that started somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000 years ago. At that point, communities were able to plant peas, lentils, and even barley to supplement some of the time they would spend foraging and hunting. They also figured out that, much like people and plants, oxen and goats reproduce as well, and they're easy to take care of if you can domesticate them. Eventually, a fraction of the effort of sprinting after or hauling food could be spent sowing seeds and tending to livestock. That's why we haven't looked back since, really. Again, the energy efficiency is what drove the transformation and allowed nomadic societies to settle into safe and more permanent locations. So we know how we started cultivating food, but how did we start cultivating enough to support billions of people? This was a question that English scholar Thomas Malthus was concerned with. In the late 1700s, he hypothesized that population growth would unavoidably supersede food production. So far, his theory's been wrong because even today, we have enough food to provide for everybody on the planet from a macronutrient perspective, of course. How did this come to be? Well, communities that were able to farm realized they may not have had everything they might need or want to advance a civilization, so they began to trade. Eventually, food had to be transported to nearby communities. Sometimes it's from a perspective of need. If all of the agricultural land in New York State was set aside and devoted straight to feeding the state, well, only half of New York City would eat. The solution? Trading food with those who have an abundance. Sometimes food is also traded from a perspective of logistics. If someone in Massachusetts wants to eat a, a mango, perhaps they could trade someone in Florida for some cranberries, since each has their respective agricultural strengths. As you can see, there are many reasons to trade food, and that's exactly what humans do even today. I can already tell some of you are growing more and more confused. This is the fourth episode of Hydrocarbon History, and all we talked about at this point is anthropology, agriculture, and markets. Where does the hydrocarbon part come in? Well, it's been right under our noses ever since I pretty much talked about Thomas Malthus. That trading aspect I mentioned is heavily dependent on the uses of hydrocarbons. Let's uh, perform a short exercise together. Imagine a food item in your fridge with me, or even just a pantry. 
doesn't really matter what it is. Just picture some produce, meat, drink, or whatever you're excited to eat soon. Where did you acquire that item? Well, likely from a grocery store. Where did the grocery store get it? From a delivery truck. Where did the truck pick it up? From some processing facility. Where did that facility get it? From another truck. You probably see where I'm going with this. We could do this all day, and eventually we would work our way back to the original hydrocarbon source, the sun. Through the whole journey from the sun to your belly, we encounter a slew of oil and gas products. The fuel in the combine that harvests the grain. The fuel in the machine that ground the grain. The oil in the packaging materials surrounding the peanut butter. The electricity consumed in the store or in your fridge to refrigerate your bag of carrots. Our expert use of hydrocarbons has allowed us to enjoy some wine from California, Wagyu beef from Japan, and a side of La potatoes from Spain, should we choose to. Still, that meal I described is very expensive thanks in part to its transportation cost. This is where we encounter a concept of food miles, or just how far the food travels from where it was produced all the way to your plate. Food miles were originally a concept concerning the energy use involved in the transportation of food. Rather than importing an item from overseas, it's better to snag some items from the local farmer's market, yes? While there is often truth to the statement, it's not always the case. A study from Iowa State titled Food, Fuel, and Freeways, an Iowa perspective on how far food travels, fuel usage, and greenhouse gas emissions looked at three levels of food sourcing in the area. Global conventional, Iowa-based regional, and Iowa-based local. Basically from uh, the biggest possible range of importing and trading all the way down to going down the street to farmer McDonald's place and <laughs> maybe picking up a pig. The study found that the local food system actually used way more energy and emitted a lot more carbon dioxide than the regional system because the trucks were smaller and required more trips. Rather than demonizing hydrocarbon-based delivery systems, the researchers suggested that there are efficiencies in aggregating sufficient volumes of supply or backhauling a different good from point B to point A that just aren't observed on local levels. Think of a really large ship moving actual tons of grains. How many truckloads would that take to be equivalent, and how do the emissions break down that way? These are all things to consider. This sort of report establishes an argument of self-reliance versus self-sufficiency. Let's hold all things constant, but eliminate our use and development of hydrocarbons. Kind of difficult to imagine, but bear with me. Firstly, food production would plummet, as we would have to go back to less dense and efficient uses of energy, like horse-drawn plows or human labor. Let's say we were able to surmount that and provide the same food output magically. Remember that New York statistic I mentioned? Well, in this situation, it wouldn't exist because without hydrocarbons, it's difficult to have food transportation that works larger than the regional level. And we already mentioned that the situation would leave half of New York City and the rest of New York State unfed. Sure, the state of Wyoming could use all of its land to easily supply for its almost 600,000 people. This would leave them self-sufficient, but if something was to threaten their food security, say mad cow disease, that could leave them crippled if they had no other forms of protein. This is why many researchers argue for self-reliance where as much food as possible is produced, processed, distributed, and purchased at multiple levels and scales within the region, resulting in maximum resilience. Yes, it's good to be able to buy local food, don't get me wrong, but it's also good to have a bunch of different methods and levels of food sourcing so you aren't caught with your pants down and your belly empty. So far, we've explained how hydrocarbons allow us to grow more food and transport at greater distances, but is there more direct relationships to be observed between oil and food? Well, to answer that, we need to revisit the oil crisis of 1973. Back then, a much smaller OPEC proclaimed an oil embargo on countries that were perceived to be supporting Israel during the Yom Kippur War. The United States was one of those countries, and oil prices rose 300% by the end of the embargo. That sun-to-belly situation I previously described was devastated with a shortage of cheap and abundant oil. Gasoline for tractors, trucks, and food processors became much more expensive. Packaging for food became more expensive. The delivery of goods, ever-increasing in scarcity, became more expensive. If anything, this just highlights the incredible importance of being able to produce your own hydrocarbons, or even better yet, be self-reliant by tapping into global trade markets, because if you don't, we run into a situation like this, and who does the cost get passed on to? That's right, you and me, when we just want to eat. Rather than viewing our food networks as dependent on oil, we should really be viewing them as enabled by oil, because many more people would go hungry in the world, many more than the ones who already do today. Thankfully, we do have cheap and abundant energy that is able to lower the cost of production and delivery of food from all over the world. Now, 
What did we learn? I'm not trying to scare anyone with doom and gloom threats of oil dependence. I'm trying to highlight the fact that oil and gas has enabled us to consume far more diverse number of foods for a much lower cost. If anything, this has strengthened our food security and provided food for many hundreds of millions of people that would not have had it without global trade networks established by our development of energy. As we saw ever since, well, as far back as we could go, people have been predicting that food sources would diminish as populations continued to grow. But hydrocarbons save us work and time to prevent that tragic downfall. Rather than toiling in a field for 365 days a year, you're able to take a Saturday afternoon to drive over to the grocery store to pick up the necessary ingredients for chicken tikka masala. Less than a century ago, it would have been ridiculously expensive just to acquire the spices necessary for that dish alone. Ideally, our food networks will continue to expand and evolve in ways that hopefully include many more in the equation and eliminate a threat of food security for many more people as time progresses. By all means, support your local food networks. I like to go to the farmer's market and the butcher shop to really splurge when I want something nice, even if it might mean potentially greater emissions per unit of energy. But still, I'm just thankful that I have the ability to buy for places all over the globe rather than forage for seeds. After all, Food doesn't come from the back of a grocery store, but even that cornucopia of human energy is powered by oil and gas. I've put all of my resources in the description of this video and the podcast, so please read through to learn more for yourself. You can go to rarepetro.com to find many more articles, episodes of other podcasts that we've done, or go to YouTube and look for the Rare Petro podcast. And hey, you can find more episodes like this if you really enjoyed it. I'm Tavis Killian with Rare Petro, and until we see you next time, take care, everybody.